I'm Bonnie Lin, Director of the China Power Project and Senior Fellow for Asian Security at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. In this episode of the China Power Podcast, we are discussing gender equality in China. China's constitution guarantees women equal rights with men in all aspects of life, and China had made strides in improving gender equality. Chinese leader Mao Zedong famously said, women hold up half the sky. However, gender equality has worsened in China in the recent decades. The Chinese government under Xi Jinping has also shut down gender activist NGOs and censored feminist platforms. What is driving this reversal in progress? And does the Chinese Communist Party perceive their growing feminist and LGBTQ activism as a threat to its leadership? Joining us for our discussion today is Dr. Leita Hong Fincher. Dr. Fincher is a research associate at Columbia University's Weatherhead East Asia Institute, an award-winning former journalist with extensive experience in China and the United States. Fluent in Mandarin, Leta is the first American to receive a PhD from Tsinghua University Department of Sociology in Beijing. She also has a master's degree from Stanford University and a bachelor's degree with high honors from Harvard University. Her newly updated book, Leftover Women, explores the resurgence of structural discrimination against women and its implications for China's economy, politics, and development. Thank you for joining us, Leita. Thank you so much for having me, Bonnie. Leita, when you look at the Global Gender Gap Report, China's ranked quite low compared to 146 countries in 2023. How do you compare China to other economies? How would you characterize China's overall performance in terms of gender equality? Well, I mean, it it is a very broad and complex topic. But as I have been arguing for many years, and I now have this 10th anniversary edition of my book, Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality, gender inequality has, has really increased very seriously over the last few decades in China. And you really need to look back in history to the early communist era under Mao Zedong, the founder of the People's Republic. And one of his most famous sayings was women hold up half the sky. So if you look back to that era in the 1950s, 60s, all the way through the 1970s, in fact, the female labor force participation rate in China was extraordinarily high, probably the highest in the world because it wasn't a market economy. So the government actually assigned women jobs as well as men. It assigned women even to senior management positions. So what we saw was with the onset of market reforms starting in the 1980s, but especially accelerating in the 90s and then past 2000 was gender inequality of many different kinds increasing, whether it's female labor force participation rates, they've been falling quite significantly since, particularly since the 1990s. That's actually in contrast to other advanced economies. And even in East Asia, if you compare with Japan in particular, or even South Korea, you know, the gender gap in labor force participation rates has been shrinking, but it's actually increasing in China. And there are so many different ways in which gender discrimination has increased in China. And we can talk about that if you like. Lita, you describe gender inequality and gender discrimination as increasing in a variety of ways. And one of the factors that you mentioned was women's changing role in the labor force in China. As you study widening gender equality in China, where have you seen the most deterioration? It's very difficult to say what is the worst because in so many different ways, women's status in the economy and in society overall in China has deteriorated relative to men. So certainly economically, one of the things that I focus on in my book, Leftover Women, is actually gender inequality and wealth that has been seriously exacerbated by the privatization of housing that really took off in the 1990s and then after 2000. And that's a kind of a complex issue, but I describe all of the ways in which women were by and large left out of this vast accumulation of residential real estate wealth 
with the rising real estate market and the, this real estate bubble. And of course, now you have a severe real estate downturn, but that's one area in which women have lost out on the accumulation of wealth. That's on top of, you know, rising gender income gaps, increasing a lot of gender di discrimination by employers, employers routinely asking, especially women who are in their 20s and 30s who are new hires, when they're planning to get married, when they're having their first baby or their second baby. But I mean, historically, you could also look at rising gender discrimination in the workforce. You could look back at the dismantling of the planned economy with the dismantling and the restructuring of state-owned enterprises starting in the 1980s even, in 1990s, when these large state-owned enterprises were restructured, there were mass layoffs. And the first to be laid off were women. And so a lot of women were forced to retire, even in their 40s, and especially in their 50s. I mean, you could look at the ongoing gender gap in retirement ages, where women are required to retire much younger than men. So there's a five to 10 year age gap in the retirement age. There's propaganda that I write a lot about. And the title of my book is Leftover Women. That refers to the term shengnu, leftover women, which was actually defined by the Chinese government in 2007 to mean a single educated professional woman who's 27 years old or older. And I outline all the ways in which this was a very aggressive propaganda campaign targeting single educated women to shame them and stigmatize them and to try to push them into getting married and, and having babies. We see that force actually intensifying from the government under Xi Jinping. And in 2023, Xi Jinping came out and directly said that China should embrace a new marriage and childbearing culture. And so you really see it everywhere. And then we could also talk about the epidemic of domestic violence. But just across the board, there is increasing discrimination against women, lower rates of political representation among women. To me, it paints a pretty dismal picture for women's rights overall in China. Thank you. You mentioned the wealth gap caused by control of real estate, gender discrimination by employers, as well as rising discrimination in the workforce, and the concept of leftover women, shengli. In addition to these factors, how have cha changes in China's birth control policy from one child policy to now what we're seeing as a three child policy in 2021 impacted women in China? Has it also increased gender inequality? Yes, certainly. So when the Chinese government initially announced at the end of 2015 that it was going to ease what's known as the one child policy, ease its very draconian controls, limiting particularly urban couples to one child. At the time, this was touted in the Chinese state media as a great relaxation uh, of controls and, and an increase in individual freedoms. But in fact, we've seen when, when you take that particular policy and and consider it together with all of the other trends regarding gender, we see that what's happening is the, the government is adopting an increasingly aggressive pro-marriage, pro-natalist policy, which is quite ironic after more than three decades of really forcing women in many cases to have fewer babies, whether it's through sex-selective abortions, through female infanticide, forced sterilizations or forced insertion of IUDs. This is something that has really just been reversed a few years ago. So the government was hoping that easing the one-child policy would result in a baby boom, but that is not what happened at all. 
In fact, birth rates have fallen for seven consecutive years because the easing of the one-child policy didn't boost birth rates. The government then turned to a two-child policy. In 2021, it announced a three-child policy. But this is not really a relaxation of controls. What we see really is an increase in aggressive propaganda, particularly targeting women, trying to push them into marrying and having babies at a younger age. This is one area that I think is bodes pretty ominously for the future. There are reports that it's much more difficult for men to get vasectomies. And, you know, I don't want to really make dire predictions <laughs> regarding abortion rights in China, but there are reports of population planning officials calling the families of newlywed couples in different parts of China, asking if the couple has gotten pregnant yet. So there are different kinds of, in addition to just very broad propaganda changes, there are different indications that we're going to see the government getting more intimately involved in the lives of these young couples. And unfortunately, that does not bode well for the future of women's rights in general. And did you see most of these changes under Xi Jinping, or did you already see traces of these policies before him? There's no question that Xi Jinping himself is extremely patriarchal. If you just look at all of his speeches, the propaganda under him, in terms of women's political representation, you could just look at the makeup of the new Politburo. The Politburo today has no women on it for the first time in about 25 years. And other indications, you know, very, very low rates of political representation among women, even at the central committee level. But the resurgence of gender inequality that I've documented a lot in my books is has been going on for quite a long time. It definitely preceded C's assumption of power. So, for example, if you just look at the propaganda campaign regarding single women, the Shengni or Leftover Women propaganda campaign was unrolled in 2007. You also saw a really pretty marked increase in discrimination against women applying to universities and particular different programs at universities were introducing quotas, basically limiting the numbers of women admitted to particular different kinds of university programs. If you took the university entrance exam, there were a lot of reports that women applying for particular programs had to score higher than men on the goal call, the university entrance exam. But those changes came before Xi's rise to power. You already saw these trends happening, but under Xi Jinping, you've seen a pretty brutal crackdown on feminist activism, particularly starting in 2015, This is something that I write about a lot in my book, Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awakening in China. So we could talk a bit more about that if you like, but this anti-feminist crackdown, which has become really quite severe under Xi Jinping, we didn't have that before his rise to power. But on the other hand, there wasn't really a significant feminist movement in the past either that was grassroots. I would like to talk about the feminist awakening in China. But before we get to that, I want to go back to a point that you raised earlier, which is the leftover women Shengli campaign, which you mentioned started in 2007. How did Chinese women react to that campaign? We've seen a lot of reporting about how many women did not like that label and some have pushed back. But how has the Shengli campaign impacted women in China? There has been a real difference in the response of women to that campaign overall. Because, I mean, after all, it's been quite a long time now 
2007. We're getting to about 20 years later now. But when when I was originally doing research and extensive interviews for the first edition of my book, Leftover Women, I was doing my research primarily between 2011 and 2013. At that time, I found that a lot of young, educated, ambitious, professional women actually felt an enormous amount of pressure to marry, that they had actually internalized some of these messages that they were getting from state propaganda, but also especially from their own parents, which, and of course, the parents are getting fed this propaganda as well. So at the time, I found that there were actually a lot of young women in their 20s who were marrying and hurrying to marry when they themselves were not that keen on getting married, just because they believed that if they didn't hurry up and marry, then they would lose out on the opportunity later on because they were told, no man is going to want to marry you. If you're older than 27, you need to really hurry up. So unfortunately, at that time, that meant that so many of these women that I was interviewing were getting married. And then along with marriage, they were purchasing housing, marital housing. And I get into this a lot in my book. A lot of these women, because they were doing quite well in the workforce, you know, maybe they had pretty high paying jobs, but they frequently would hand over their life savings to their fiance or boyfriend, even before they married, to finance the purchase of a really expensive marital home that would then be registered solely in the man's name. This is one part of why women were shut out of this vast accumulation of residential real estate wealth, but it's a pretty complex dynamic as well. I mean, just very briefly, parents, I found, routinely discriminated against their own daughters even in terms of purchasing housing for their children, whereas parents of sons would regularly scrape and save and look to other relatives to try to buy housing for sons, but it was seen as not necessary to help women, to help daughters buy housing. And it's a very complex dynamic. So there's a huge difference today, though. Over the past decade, there have been more and more women who have become aware of the need to stand up for their rights, and they've reached out to other women like them, and they're much more inclined to resist that kind of marriage pressure. And so we've also seen seven years of declining birth rates, but the marriage rates declined for nine straight years. And there's a little bit of an uptick in marriage in 2023, but basically the trend is dramatically falling marriage rates. And one of the big Developments driving that decline in marriage rates is young women themselves increasingly saying no to marriage, or at least saying, I don't need to marry this young, I'm going to put it off. And that goes hand in hand with a rising consciousness about women's rights in general. And so that's a really big development. That's actually, I see that as a very positive development. Thank you, Leita. It's great to hear that there are some positive movements happening within China on gender. I want to ask you about something that you highlight in your research as an important change within China, and that's a change in China's marriage law in 2011. And that change ruled that family homes purchased before marriage now belong to the registered buyer after divorce. What impact has this change had on gender inequality and power dynamics within the Chinese family? In 2011, there was a change in the marriage law. Prior to then, really when the Communist Party introduced the marriage law in, I believe, 1950, and for many decades, marital property was regarded as common property. So if couples divorced, then they were supposed to split the marital property equally. But then in 2011, the highest 
court in China announced that there was going to be a new judicial interpretation. They said, basically, when you divorce, whoever bought the marital home gets to keep that home. But it was incredibly vague. They just left it at that. Feminist lawyers at the time said that this new law, this change to the marriage law, made it a quote unquote man's law because in practice, most marital homes were solely registered in men's names. So that meant that, of course, when a couple divorced, then the woman would not get the marital property. So this was a huge blow to women's, particularly married women. But sadly, the situation has become even worse in recent years. When I was writing the updated version of my book, Leftover Women, I had to put in all this this new section saying that it's become increasingly difficult, as difficult as it used to be for women to get a divorce when their partners were abusive. It is even more difficult. It's almost impossible today for women to get a divorce if their spouse does not agree. And this is a dramatic decrease in women married women's rights. And you could look in particular at new research by the sociologist Ethan Michelson, who did a very large scale survey of divorce cases, over 100,000 divorce cases in China, showing that judges routinely denied divorce requests in court. And then basically women, because women are the vast majority of those seeking a divorce, that basically there was no hope for women of getting a divorce at all unless they were prepared to go through an entire trial. And then the judge would deny their request. And then they would have to file a second time through the courts for a divorce. And then maybe they would be granted the divorce. They would be more likely to get it. But of course, most people don't even get to that stage of going to court. A lot of women who are seeking a divorce just give up because it is so difficult. And that's not even taking into consideration a new policy change. In 2021, the government introduced what is called the divorce cooling off period, which sounds very innocuous. And the idea is that, oh, if you're a married couple and you want a divorce, we ask that you wait a while because, you know, maybe your feelings will improve towards each other if you wait a little while. In effect, what that means, again, is yet another major obstacle for, in particular, for women who are trying to get a divorce, especially when their partner doesn't want them to get a divorce. Now, this is particularly bad for women in abusive marriages, of course. Unfortunately, what the research has shown in recent years is that it doesn't matter how severe the abuse is that you have suffered in a marriage. If you're a woman and victims of domestic violence are predominantly women, that judges will still deny you a divorce in most cases. This is a terrible blow to women's rights. And this is also a reason that more and more particularly educated young women don't want to get married today. Thank you. That is troubling to hear. Maybe I could take a step back and ask you, based off what you're seeing in terms of both Chinese propaganda and your overall research on Chinese government policies towards women, what exactly does the Chinese government envision the role of women to be? Is it mainly as a wife, as a filial daughter that takes care of aging parents, as a mother to take care of younger children, and then perhaps in the workplace or at school, they can take on supporting roles but not leadership roles? Basically, I think what you said was absolutely correct. I mean, this has been a trend for quite a long time, ever since 2007, when the government unrolled this propaganda campaign, stigmatizing single women, calling them shengnu, leftover women, pushing them into marriage, pushing them into traditional roles of wife and mother, 
in the home, that trend has intensified in recent years. And under Xi Jinping, it has become even more pronounced. Basically, the constitution of the Communist Party or the People's Republic of China still has enshrined the notion of gender equality. I mean, gender equality was one of the key principles of the communist revolution many decades ago. And so for decades, you would see this mentioning of how gender equality is one of the key pillars of the Communist Party. But even that kind of rhetoric, just plain rhetoric, supporting gender equality has really significantly decreased in recent years. And so this is another very troubling development. Unfortunately, not surprising because this has just been the direction for almost 20 years, but it's become more and more explicit. If you look at the propaganda in recent years, particularly under Xi Jinping and the way he talks about family values, you know, women's role is very explicitly today under Xi Jinping supposed to be subservient to men. So women are supposed to play their quote unquote correct role in the family. They're supposed to maintain these harmonious families. So the government is trying to boost falling birth rates and falling marriage rates, but you don't see any significant increase in financial support for married couples to have children. Basically, I argue that Xi Jinping in particular sees the subjugation of women in general as being key to the political stability of the Communist Party, that in many different ways that the subjugation of women is seen as necessary to contain potential violence in China. So we were just talking about this epidemic of domestic violence. So basically, the government adopted this anti-domestic violence law. It was enacted in 2016, but it has not been enforced at all. I mean, legally, victims of domestic violence are allowed to get a restraining order against their abuser, but in practice, it's virtually impossible to get a restraining order. So basically what it means is the government turns a blind eye to any violence against women. And in fact, I believe it actually relies on private violence against women so that as long as men are basically allowed to be violent with their wives, you know, or with their children, they're not going to be punished for that violence as long as it takes place within the privacy of their home. Nobody's going to intervene. Nobody's going to punish the violent man. These are very worrying trends, and that's a very strong argument you made. But I guess the question is, why would Chinese women, particularly well-educated Chinese women, put up with that? You mentioned that one way that they are responding is more and more of them are not getting married or are pushing off marriage until a later date. Are you also seeing more educated, perhaps potentially wealthier women leaving China and not returning? This isn't something that I have looked at closely, so that's not something I can speak to with any degree of authority. What I can point to is certainly in terms of leaving China. Well, let's have a look at political demonstrations or protests. So at the end of um, 2022, there were these so-called white paper protests where a lot of, not a lot, I mean, there were protests in quite a few different cities. Young people gathered outside. This was an extraordinary display of resistance to the government's so-called zero COVID policies. And so these young people were holding up blank pieces of paper to symbolize censorship and repression. And a lot of the people on the front lines of those protests, if you looked at all of the footage and the news reports, a lot of those people taking a prominent position on the front lines of those protests were young women. And then if you look at reports of the police who arrested these protesters subsequently, you know, a lot of the arrests 
made were of young women. And the police would ask, well, are you a feminist or are you a lesbian? You know, or you're a tool of manipulation by so-called hostile foreign forces. This corresponds with a feminist movement in China that is being extremely resilient. And one thing that we have seen since the end of 2022, I mean, it's very recent, obviously, but also for the first time, you've seen a lot of young Chinese who are studying abroad, including the US, but also other countries, took to the streets and protested openly against the Chinese government in fairly large numbers compared to what they used to do. I mean, you just didn't see young Chinese people taking to the streets to protest before, certainly not since 1989 and the Tiananmen protests. There's also been a huge increase in feminist activities among the Chinese diaspora in different countries, including the US, the UK, Canada. So I, you know, I'm not familiar with the actual statistics on women versus men trying to leave China, but certainly there, anecdotally, there has been an increase in Chinese fleeing the country and trying illegally to get, you know, to come to the U.S. to seek asylum. But there are very limited ways in which women inside China are able to resist. One of the most effective ways for them to resist is privately through their lifestyle choices, through a decision to not get married or not have children. Your description of how Chinese police respond to female protesters is very interesting. So if Chinese authorities believe that you're a feminist, would they also think that you're an agent of foreign forces? And similarly, your story also seems to suggest that Chinese authorities equate feminism with lesbianism. In what ways do you see the intersection between women's equality and a push for LGBTQ plus rights in China? Feminist beliefs have become a lot more mainstream among young Chinese women. So the authorities would not automatically assume that just because you say you're feminist, you would be an agent of quote unquote hostile foreign forces. As for the LGBTQ plus rights movement, there is definitely a lot of overlap between the feminist movement and LGBTQ plus rights activism. And in fact, many feminist activists are themselves queer or non-binary. Thank you, Leita. Let me ask you one final question to wrap up this podcast. Given all that you've described and discussed with us, what do you see as some of the most important long-term trends or implications of rising gender equality in China and China's policy towards women? So gender inequality has really worsened significantly in recent years. And of course, political repression has also worsened. I still have hope for the future. I see the feminist movement in general as incredibly resilient. Feminist beliefs are more and more mainstream. As an example, you know, a lot of young Chinese women, especially those who are college educated, are deliberately choosing to stay single rather than get married and fall into what many of them call a patriarchal trap. Another thing that is heartening to see is the popularity of books by this Japanese feminist sociologist, Chizuko Ueno, whose books are bestsellers. They're translated into Chinese and millions of young Chinese women are reading them. And she's like this feminist celebrity. And so there is still a little bit of space for resistance, even in spite of all of the other bad news. Thank you, Leita. I really appreciated this fascinating discussion with you about women's role and progress in China. It is unfortunate to hear about the worsening trends, but as you point out, there are also reasons to be optimistic for the future. I think this only underscores why it's so important for us to continue to monitor changes to women's rights and equality with China. Thank you again for joining me today. 